Welcome, welcome everyone to Z Sides. I am your host, Jakiva Phillips. I am the editor in chief of Word Lit Zine, the magazine this show is based off of. So in Z Sides, we showcase artists. We have them read for you, we get down to real talk with interviews, and best of all, we even play a nerdy game or two. So are you ready? Today, this is a two-part segment called Hugo House, Now and Then. We're gonna be talking to event coordinator and newbie on the block at Hugo House, Mr. Rob Arnold. Let's see what he has in store for us. This is a poem called Slingerlands. Slingerlands. There was ambivalence in the snowfall. We had watched the shapes of deer slip eerily into the gap of the woods, all haunch and headlight, and the negative space where eyes would go. Crows clotting in trees or misting over the throughway like effluvia from our dreams. The sky in the west had opened its throat. The shadows lengthened with no words. Later, we'd pull off our skins and lie sleepless till daybreak, emptied, undignified, drawn into the strangeness of the other's heat. But for the moment, we stayed, looking out into the almost motionless blue, while the neighborhood shimmered, so it seemed, between us. Then there was the black hound baying, then the closing of the mouth, the regret and the consequence, the hot breath on our thighs. Strike through. There are nights we take off our clothes to read the stories written over us. Nights we unmask the pain the moment of clarity when our skin parted and the violence rushed in. Seams where the boundary between one life and the next grow thin, where mortality shimmers through, intimacies that lovers might reveal when they first undressed as we did years ago, then did again, haltingly, after surgery had drawn its mark. Though I understand I'm not supposed to look not supposed to notice how the scar bisects you nape to pelvis like a terrible strike through. Just as you pretend not to see my own disfigurements, the flesh lumped and puckered, where as a child I was bruised and bitten, beaten and bled. There are nights like this when the junctions dilate, when the world would force us open and scrape us clean inside. Nights our bodies grow beyond themselves, their small sovereignties, when our hands would meet along the fault lines of our scarring like two failures and couple there, shame to shame, with no language to guide them. Or nights of impossible closeness, when our fears would coalesce around our scars as around this crucifix of spine and shoulder blade I touch some nights before we sleep. When even the darkness would shed its defenses and black rivulets sluicing down the window panes. You were sitting at the edge of the bed. You pulled your hair aside. The slick skin of our scars shone in the low light. Shadows creeping up the wall as we lay there imperfectly together and prepared ourselves for the long astonishment. And these next two poems are about memory. And this poem is called Coyote. Coyote. Remember it like you'd remember a photograph, the flash of gray fur and shadow that dashed your high beams 20 years ago, somewhere near the Nevada border speeding through the reservation at night, long gravel roads stretching out to nowhere. The animal stilled mid-stride in the fog of dust and thrown light, the limbless arc of its body, tail tucked in fear or haste, a conjuring, a suspension, a smear of awareness before it was gone again, completing the blackness. Was it even a coyote? A Shoshone dog maybe running loose in the night, 
some lost wandering phantom of the high desert, half swallowed by time and hazed recollection. Or something else, perhaps, simmering close to the bone, a flare of recognition, of fear and urgency, like yourself at that age, so young, so dispirited, fleeing already the failings of family, what ossifies within us, your mother gone at 53, your sister soon to follow. The lattice work of scars that crosshatch your body, a registry and flesh of every strike, every burn, every bite, subdermal lumps you carried like a sickness in your core. What remains? A slip of the mind, a trick played by the dead on the living, the space that bodies hurtle through and cross over, a place between states, between selves, the night wind aching between, the between itself aching, ephemeral. The old white pickup truck, faint glow silhouetting the ridge, the coyote long gone, diminishing like a dream or a covenant between the universe and yourself all the possibility it would deliver, all the isolation and wildness and loss. And this last poem is a poem um, about childhood. Um, and it opens with a series of numbers, and those numbers are, um, are the uh, makes and models of guns. This is called Mercury 1984. The smell, the burn, the clash, the muzzle flash, sear and kick, clay birdies arcing overhead, the 12 gauge, 20 gauge, 30 30, 22. The SKS semi automatic we took to the shooting range, we took out to the woods, to the river, the slow crawl of mud, aiming at frogs, at squirrels, at each other as a joke. The black powder flintlock. Bullets we forged in the garage, hot lead we fluxed with the wax, we poured in the molds, we quenched in the pail by the trash piles, muck and reek its maggoty froth, foul detritus, the beer can ashtrays, mildewed coffee mugs, the milk jug of mercury our father kept for work. We poured it out in the driveway, watched it reveal it particulate, like molten fire, like a sea of stars, a mirror for the dead staring back, the strange alchemy, riparian spark you showed to me, big brother, you dipped your fingers in, you scattered the droplets, letting them reassemble, a kind of perfection we inhaled, we took deeply into our bodies, and somehow did not kill ourselves, not yet, whatever mistakes we made whatever damage is done. All right, everyone, it is time for some real talk. I am here with Rob, the event coordinator over at Hugo House. Rob, you are the newbie at Hugo House. I don't mean that as a stigma. I love newbies. You're also a new friend because we just worked together at, uh, during Lit Crawl. So I feel like I don't know you as much as I should. Tell, tell me about yourself. What's going on? Who is Rob Arnold? Oh my gosh, so I am, I am yes, I'm the new person um, at Hugo House and new to Seattle a little bit. Um, so I actually did my undergraduate work here. I studied with Rick Kenny and Linda Beards at UW for undergrad, then moved to Boston for graduate school and um, uh, got trapped in Boston for kind of a while um, and moved back very recently to uh, curate events over at Hugo House. Cool. So, but I'm a poet um, and I, um, I've worked on some literary magazines. I started a, an online journal called Memorius. Um, Wait, time out. We got a high five for zines. Okay, yeah. Woo, zines! Ow, zines. <laughs> <laughs> As a zine producer myself, mm -hmm. I love them. So I got to give you some big ups for that. So I'm sorry, continue. Well, I love, I mean, I love working um, at a literary magazine and you probably have the same feeling too, the curatorial spirit of it, um, feeling like you can discover new talent and new work and, you know, and, and even, um, interesting new work by, by people you already know. Um, so that's, that's a fun thing. And I went from Memorius to working on the literary magazine Plowshares, um, which is based out of Emerson College. And then from there went to a magazine and small press called Fence, um, and then working in trade publishing at Beacon, 
press. Then, um, then I worked at a literary agency for a while before coming here. So I've been doing a lot of um, work on the other side of, of things where um, making books come into the world. But now it's, it's fun to celebrate the book once it's been out. That's a good way of putting it, yeah. yeah. I feel like if you are uh, producing that, you're so in the grindstone of the world, you gotta get it out there, deadlines, that it's nice to see the finished product. Absolutely. Um, do you feel like, uh, because you were so involved in that world, did you think that it took away from you having your own writer time? Well, you know, it's always a balance, and um, something that I've been um, traditionally not great at making the balance, you know, definitely favoring other people's work over my own, but now I'm trying to do uh, trying to be more intentional about that balance and, um, you know, obviously um, celebrating other people's work, but, but writing my own um, as well, making sure I spend enough time to, to write and publish and do the thing, the, do the, the writer work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I feel you on that one. It's, it's hard to be a writer sometimes if you're also a writer and an events producer. Mm -hmm. So you said you went to uh, graduate school in Boston. Mm -hmm. And you said you got trapped in Boston, <laughs> which makes me think there was something about Boston that didn't quite click with you or, or something. People don't say they get trapped in a place unless they want to desperately leave. So tell me about Boston. Just a little well, bit. when I first moved to Boston, I moved from Seattle and I hated Boston. It was cold. It was dirty. It was, you know, it was rough. Um, you know, the, the, all the nice people that I, you know, came to know here in Seattle, um, they had somehow transmutated into mean people in Boston. <laughs> you know, there's a real culture of meanness on the East Coast in general, but in Boston particularly, people take pride in it. I remember first moving there and um, walking across the Common where, you know, my graduate school, Emerson College, was right on the, the Boston Common, and I was taking a walk across the Common, and some random person walked up to me and just looked me up and down and said, Ch, welcome to Boston. Like, <laughs> so judgmental. <laughs> so that was my experience with Boston. That was your that. introduction to Boston. That was my introduction to Boston. <laughs> that was the welcome wagon. Yes, exactly. And, and I, I came to peace with Boston and came to even have some affection for Boston um, over, over the years that I was there. Um, and it's a really terrific literary scene. There's a you know, wonderful community and, um, uh, you know, of writers there and of people publishing and uh, working on literary work there. So it's a, it's a wonderful place to be, um, but it does take some getting used to if you're, if you're used to, you know, the sort of kindness of, of the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Like we have our own unique flavor here and we're not perfect, but I think our, uh, we have that, um, what's that called, passive aggressiveness, right? Mm. Much more tolerable in some ways than just, <laughs> welcome to Boston. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, the, yeah, the Seattle freeze, which I've yet to experience, um, is, is apparently Yay. a thing. And, you know, coming from, from the culture of Boston, you know, I found moving back here to everybody to be so welcoming. And, you know, in, in a way it's, um, it's, it's and, and, then, and then landing at Hugo House, where I'm really at the center of, you know, a lot of, activity, a lot of the literary scene revolves around Hugo House, and so I'm very, I'm very fortunate to have landed right, right in the middle of, 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 a, of an excellent community again, so. That's great. Yeah. What, speaking of Hugo House, what are your plans? What, what's going on? What do you have brewing into the works? Well, you know, I mean, obviously it's, you know, it's a lot of work to, to curate a reading series, you know, and um, I can talk about sort of general... Um, sure, don't ha you don't reveal any secrets, but I just kind of <laughs> want to know. So you come in from Boston, mm -hmm. you're fresh, you like want to inject something more into Hugo House or, or add more to it. I'm just curious what that is in general. Well, I mean, for me, one of the guiding principles um, as I'm curating is, are the principles that Hugo House was founded on, which are inclusion, equity. Um, you know, Richard Hugo, um, our namesake, was a, you know, was a wonderful teacher, and he came from, you know, a, a, a poor background, uh, working class, and he really, you know, he came up and became one of the nationally known poets and a wonderful teacher. And something, you know, what I'm always mindful of is how we can make opportunities for people um, in that same spirit. Um, so I'm really trying to, 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 I guess, channel the spirit of Richard Hugo as I'm curating events for um, for Hugo House, one of the things that I'm always suspicious of are um, top-down models of curation, where mm -hmm. you're only looking at the people who are already successful, you're only looking at the people who are have made a name for themselves. I think that top-down models have traditionally been um, very uh, exclusionary um, and have limited voices of 
people of color, limited voices of people who are from poor backgrounds. They have limited people who don't have the privilege to go to an Ivy League school. So those models I'm very suspicious of. And so as I'm, at the same time, we have to celebrate work that's great um, as well. So, so I'm really trying to find a balance between, between um, what's great and what's amazing and what's, what's upcoming. Maybe somebody we haven't heard of but is writing really wonderful work. And, um, you know, so those are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about as I'm, as I'm saying yes to, to event requests or as I'm seeking out people to appear at Hugo House, um, really trying to keep an eye on, you know, to make sure and to keep my own biases in check as I'm, as I'm doing it. I have my own tastes, but at the same time, um, you know, moving from plowshares, for example, um, to fence. Um, plowshares is a very traditional um, literary magazine, you know, it's very top down. And Fence is very wild and strange, you know, and, and you know, there might be a poem by, you know, s you know, somebody writing really absurdist poetry about, you know, circus animals. And then, uh, you know, so it's not, it's not as lyrical, it's not as densely lyrical as Plowshares. And I had to really understand a new model of poetry. Um, and so I'm always trying to learn, I'm always trying to keep myself open to new ideas and new, um, you know, different ways of thinking about literature, different literatures, different um, different languages that people are writing in. So that's something that I'm, you know, that I'm personally curious about and trying to um, make myself, you know, be open to. That's great. Yeah. I mean, you said two things that I love, which is first of all that you're suspicious about top-down models because mm -hmm. I think top-down models uh, almost happen out of fear. Mm -hmm. Like businesses, they need to make money, so they want to get in the big names. We're not going to say no to the famous ones, but we're also not going to say no just because somebody doesn't have a name out. I think that's, I think that's what makes Seattle great. I think that's what makes Seattle a growing city, mm -hmm. and I think that's what makes Seattle a great city to, to really kind of hone your skills and, and grow yourself as a writer, because it's not cutthroat, mm -hmm. right? There are still a lot of folks out there that are like, I want to know what you're doing. Oh, this is your first time doing poetry? You just took a class? Oh, you just wrote a short story? Cool, come to my reading, do a thing. And, and uh, certainly at Works in Progress, which I love Works in Progress, that uh, happens at Hugo House, there's never a more positive environment than at that space, which is why when new people in town are always like, where should I go? I want to get more into like poetry and fiction. I'm like, go to Hugo House, mm. go to Works in Progress because it's a super positive environment. Works in Progress is our, um, is our open mic series every other Monday at Hugo House. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this whole idea of not having, you know, checking your own bias because right. I know that I have my own biases too. And sometimes you just have to be like, it's not my cup of tea, mm -hmm. but is it technically good? Is there an right. audience for it? And not just recreating the stuff that you want to see because that's not an inclusive community. Well, right, and the other thing is, you know, it really limits your audience. And as, a, as an event curator, I'm really mindful of trying to not only um, bring different kinds of voices to Hugo House, but open it to different kinds of audiences. And if you're, if you're only curating a particular kind of high lyric poem, you're only going to get people who are interested in that particular kind of high lyric poem. And so, um, so it's going to be very like one noted one, you know, and you'll probably serve that community very well, uh, but you know, but what other communities are you excluding? And that's something that I'm always trying to think about is who, you know, different kinds of writers bring different kinds of audiences. Different kinds of writing brings different kinds of audiences. And that's something that I'm really wanting at Hugo House is a lot of different kinds of audiences. So one thing that we did in the fall is we brought in um, Ted Chang and Karen Joy Fowler, um, you know, two sort of genre, sort of masters of genre. Um, Ted Chang wrote a story that got um, turned into the film Arrival. So he's sort of a sci-fi, oh. like a really like nerdy, brainy sci-fi writer. Um, and Karen Joy Fowler writes kind of a lot of different kinds of speculative work, a really imaginative writer. She wrote the Jane Austen Book Club. And they were in conversation. And we had, we had I, think, I think that event sold out. So we had 160 people squeezed into our theater at Hugo House. And you know, looking around, you didn't see a lot of the same familiar faces. And that's something that I really love, is to, to bring hundreds of people to Hugo House who've never been to Hugo House before. That, to me, is a successful event. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Um, so you can be honest with me. No one's watching. What are some of your biases? What's your bias? -y? Oh I'll my gosh. I'll show you my. I'll tell you mine if you tell me yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I am. I am. I am partial to lyric poetry, high lyric poetry. I mean, it's it's something that I write. I write about. You know, I, I write in the tradition of like lyric narrative, um, like Larry Levis or. Um, 
or Anne Sexton, um, mm -hmm. you know, these kinds of like kind of close to the bone, um, but like, you know, with a lot of beauty and a lot of imagery. That's something that I'm really fond of as a, as a you know, as a writer and as a reader. Um, and also, you know, I mean, I grew up reading, you know, crappy sci-fi books. <laughs> <laughs> And like, you know, Stephen King books. So I'm not, I'm, you know, at the, you know, all of that to say is I, I have a, you know, I have a broad range in, of interests. You know, I like, I like graphic novels. I'd love to do some more, you know, events on that kind of, you know, using graphic um, types of writing, those kinds of things. Um, yeah, yeah, and there's, there's a huge uh, market for that. Like not, not to be like, oh, get your money. But what I mean to say is there are a lot of people that are hungry to, mm -hmm. to know more about the graphic novel universe. And you got a lot of nerds in that category who want to hear from their favorite writers and stuff. Uh, and we have a wonderful, novels. yeah, we have a wonderful publisher of, you know, graphic novels based here in Seattle, Fanographic. So, mm -hmm. you know, so taking advantage of what's here is also something I'm interested in doing. You know, who's who's making interesting work? Who's doing interesting art here in Seattle? Um, I really want to explore that. And as a person who's new um, to the scene, I guess sort of, you know, returning to the scene, um, it's, you know, the past few months have been a furious, race to try to understand who's doing the things now, who's, what's, what kind of vital f voices are out there right now versus what, what, were, what was happening when I was an undergraduate here. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, but, I, but I'm interested in all of that too. That's great. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about your poetry. Okay. Because uh, you were saying that you really like lyric poetry and that's what you write. And I remember when you were reading and I was listening, I was like, oh, it's so messy and like dirty. And I mean mm -hmm. that with love, not that mm -hmm. the poetry itself, but that what you created was that way. And I just loved it. I was, it was just that kind of environment where you can just almost see the grit mm -hmm. of just these people's lives. Um, and, and then you said, uh, they're love poems, but with scar tissue. And I was like, oh man, like you need to write that down somewhere. <laughs> like, it's so good, I love it. Um, so so tell, me about, tell me about your poetry. I mean, obviously you are inspired by lyric poetry, but mm -hmm. where does all that come from? What inspires you? That's a very good question. In fact, back to the love poem with scar tissue, um, uh, uh, tagline, I guess, I, I, that was an early title for that that poem. Um, so when when working that poem, it was at one point it was called "Love Poem with Scar Tissue." Um, but um, uh, yeah, so where does my poetry come from? That's a very good question. I'm glad that you picked up on the messiness of it and the sort of um, you know the the I don't know the rawness of it. That's something that I'm trying to do. When I was I think when I was a young writer, I was very careful, and so I'd write these like little tiny jewel-like um, pieces of poetry that were like five lines long, and they were just beautiful lead, like intricate and, you know, and impossible to understand <laughs> as a result. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, part of my mission as a writer has been to kind of expand that out. Um, I'm writing a lot of family stories right now. Um, so like that Mercury um, poem is a poem about, you know, growing up with a, an older brother who was a little bit of, you know, um, you know, like a lot of older brothers. Um, and, and uh, just a little bit wild mm -hmm. and we um, you know and, and there were and there were guns in the house <laughs> so, <laughs> so wildness plus guns equals um, you know poetry um, <laughs> if you uh, kids if you're ever <laughs> looking for a recipe for poetry that's, wildness plus guns poetry yeah that's yeah. the formula of poetry yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a messy childhood and I'm um, like a lot of people did I you know I grew up in a military family we moved around a lot um, and it's also um, a very you know strange family it's knitted together we have um, I'm adopted um, I have an adopted younger sister um, I have two actually adopted younger sisters one adopted with me my biological sister we were adopted together and then my youngest sister was also adopted and you know my um, my oldest two sisters are from my mother's first marriage and then my next two siblings so it's a big messy family mm -hmm. and um, and part of the poetry is about untying all those knots um, and you know, trying to tell some of these family stories that, as a, you know, that if you if you come from a big messy family that moves around a lot, you do accumulate some family stories. Yeah. So that's where some of the poetry comes from, and you know, of course, it's also refracted through the lens of poetry. It's not. I'm not telling. You know, you know, I'm not reporting what happened. You know, I'm making a, I'm making art out of it. So of course, it's going to be a little bit different. It's a refracted version mm -hmm. of reality versus a, an actual version of reality. But you know. We have a new segment that I like to call Hidden Talent or Puzzle. Okay. And so I want to know, do you want to play a nerdy puzzle or would you like to showcase a hidden talent? 
Oh my, that's a very good question. I don't know that I have any talents, so I think I'll have <laughs> to go with the puzzle. Clearly you have at least one. <laughs> you have at least one. Um, okay, so I had this spidey sense that you were going to be doing a puzzle. Okay. And seeing as you have a little quirky named Ginger, I thought that it would be only appropriate to do a quirky based trivia puzzle. Okay. Are you ready for this? I have to be. Okay. <laughs> I love that. I have no choice. That is true. All right, so I'm going to pull out my handy dandy note card of the 21st century. Okay. Ah, a cell phone. <laughs> Just like a true millennial. <laughs> All right, so I have devised a puzzle for you, and it's three questions. Okay. All right, so if you get one question correctly, you get a hug. Okay. If you get two questions correctly, you uh, get a longer hug. Okay. If you get all three questions correctly, you are going to get a sweet prize. Oh, cool. Okay, all all right. Right. are you ready for this? Yes. All right, so question number one. Okay. Corgis are the preferred dog breed of which British monarch? A, Elizabeth I, B, Elizabeth II, or C, Elizabeth III? Oh, this is really a question on Elizabeths. <laughs> <laughs> you hmm. must know your Elizabeths. Well, I, I know there are at least two, so it's not A. Um, so I'm going to go with, I don't know about a third, so I'm going to go with B. Queen Elizabeth II? Yes. You're correct! Yay! Yay! <laughs> uh, Queen Elizabeth has had over 30 uh, corgis over her entire lifetime. That's a lot of poop to scoop, <laughs> but she's the queen, so she probably doesn't scoop it. Yes. But <laughs> they come with each one poop scooper. <laughs> <laughs> They're born with it. Okay, right. so that is question. That's question number one. So you okay. already are getting a hug. All right. Let's see if we can make it longer. Question number two: Corgis have a condition called achondroplasia, which is a form of what? A dwarfism, B jaw displacement, or C webbing between the toes. Oh my goodness! I'm going to go with dwarfism. And you're correct. Yay. <laughs> see, and you were like nervous. He's like, I don't want to play. <laughs> <laughs> and you already have earned a longer hug. So, all right, right so third one. Let's go for the okay. All right, corgis can trace their lineage all the way back to which year? A, 1107, B, 1066, or C, 791? Wow, that's all of them are long, much longer than I, I know. expected. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, um, I would say I'm going to go with A. A, yeah. 1107? Yes. That's correct! Oh, yay! yay. <laughs> <laughs> so you got all three correct? Yay! yay. <laughs> all right, so for your prize, you are getting, drum roll please, a free word lit zine bag. Oh, there you go. that's amazing. That's yes. beautiful. And I can, um, I can put, all, I can almost fit my corgi in this. Thank you so much for sharing your poetry, and thank you so much for all the things that you are going to do at Hugo House. I know it is going to be great. Thank you. So if you have not already, please check out the partner piece of this episode, Hugo House, Now and Then, with Francis McHugh, one of the co-founders. And as always, I am your host, Jakiva Phillips. You have been Rob Arnold. I have been Rob Arnold. That is very true. Still all right, am. tune in for another episode of Z Sides. Now, always remember the three main tenets. Read a book, read local, and buy the damn book. All right. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. We'll see you again next time. Bye.